Hello and welcome to an ownership review of my family car. It is a Mercedes E-Class E220 CDI of the W211 generation. And we are going to talk about why you might want to own one as a family car. You are maybe considering a Dacia Jogger or a Skoda Kodiak because you want seven seats. And one of the reasons why you may want to own the E-Class that I have is because it has seven seats. It's comfortable and quiet. It has smooth power delivery. It has Apple CarPlay and it only cost me £3,000. So first of all, let's start off with the boot, which is where the party trick is. And this is one of the very few cars that has rear words facing seats in the boot. And it has basically three rows, two seats in the, in the front, um, three in the middle and two in the back. And um, those two in the back, they are basically in the boot floor and you fold them up uh, when they're not in use. Um, they are completely flush with the floor, so you can't even tell that there are spare seats in the boot. And why do you want seven seats? Well, you might be a big family. You may also occasionally have grandparents that are staying with you and need a lift. And you might therefore need uh, a couple of extra seats to be able to accommodate the entire family. Or occasionally, um, you might need a couple of spare seats to help friends out with school runs or to bring some of your children's friends along with you to a birthday party celebration somewhere. So this is a perfect car for that because the seats in the back are exactly that. They are occasional seats and the same applies to the Dacia Jogger. Um, as well as the Skoda Kodiak. If you're a large family like the Kardashians or or if you're a boxer with an entourage of bodyguards, etc., then you're better off with a purpose-built um, seven or nine-seater car like a Mercedes V-Class, a VW Caravel or a Ford Galaxy. So, um, with this E-Class, the good thing about rearward-facing seats versus frontward-facing ones is that everyone can enter the car at the same time and really quickly. The people in the third row do not need to climb in before those in the second row. Um, and that makes a huge difference. And it just gets everyone into the car a lot quicker. And if you're someone who have child seats in the middle row, then it will probably be quite cumbersome having to take a seat out fold the seat forward and let someone climb into to the back or everyone might be seated in the car and at the last minute someone in the third row wants to use the toilet or grab a soft toy in the house and instead of you having to ask people in the second row to, to, to move away those in the boot can simply just open the boot hatch climb out do whatever they want to and then get back into the car so all you need to do as the driver is to just jump into your seat and you don't need to assist the kids with getting people in and out of the third row. So that is a huge bonus. And um, with those facing rearwards, that gives them a little bit of a private space because their voices are actually projected away from everyone else in the car. So that actually makes the car feel a little bit more quieter. And it's great if you have kids that don't really get along or that are prone to getting into fights, etc. Then um, having kids on different roles help. And I've even um, been in the car where I've had myself in the first in the first row someone in the second row and someone in the third row and it was fantastic it just felt like everyone had their own private space so that is good and um also the third row doesn't really take long to fold up like it takes a couple of seconds um and it can be done uh just with one person as well you you know you don't need four hands to do it and um with the headrest they can be neatly stored in um, some of the cubbies that are in the boot as well and that storage is really good because also those in the back they can put books in there snacks and um, there's also some additional nets just um, on the base of, of the seat pad seat pad in the third row 
Um, and there's also cup holders. So overall, like it's a very accommodating third, um, third row and it's completely, in, completely inconspicuous and it's a lovely bonus. Um, and now for the exterior of the car, and this is not really the most attractive looking car in the world, uh, but I'm quite charmed by this generation E class. It's actually been on my bucket list of cars to own because I believe that this design has aged very well, especially in saloon form. The estate is long, is it's a really long car. And in black with tinted windows, it looks a little bit like a hearse. So for me, a black color was not an option here. Instead, I ended up with a pensioner spec car. So the color on the exterior is Cubanite silver. Um, it's a mix of silver, champagne, and gray and beige. It's difficult to photograph. Like in some photograph, it looks a little bit beige, other time a little bit gray, uh, and sometimes a little bit silver. The bonus of this color is that um, it stays clean really, really easy. Like it looks almost the same, regardless of whether it's been washed or whether it's dirty, uh, which is perfect for the UK because it periodically rains here and that can make cars look dirty um, incredibly quickly. And this car also has 16 inch alloys with a very big tire profile, um, which I like because it makes the car comfortable and compliant on bumpy B roads. Um, and on the inside, it has this part cloth, part leather look. And um, this is unique to the avant-garde trim, which I have. So there's three different trims, classic, elegance, and avant-garde. And the avant-garde, um, it's kind of the top range in terms of, um, you know, like standard equipment. And it's also the sporty trim that sits a little bit below AMG. Um, and it sits about 10 millimeters lower than classic and elegance. And um, as a result, the handling is sportier than you would expect. It's not a sporty car, but it's more engaging and enjoyable to drive through bends than I expected. And um, the interior includes uh, a wood, wood inlays. It's actually rear wood, um, not plastic veneers. And it's a really cool um olivey beige looking like wood that i've never seen anywhere else before and also the beauty of this car is that the inlays are pretty generous in the car and it goes from the center console from the armrest up the center console and then wraps around the cabin and it makes the cabin look like homely expansive and a luxurious place to be um, and with the seats i love them because the cloth it keeps you in place and makes sure that you don't like roll around in the car and it also eliminates the need for heated seats and also leather on the outside the leather is very durable it's actually a non-animal leather which is a surprise because when this car was made in 2006 um luxury was synonymous with leather um especially in premium cars so to like see that there was actually a animal a non-animal leather option back then is quite impressive and it's held up really well like this car is in fantastic condition and when i saw it i knew that that's the car i need to buy i really need to buy it because all the previous owners have looked after it really well and i booked flights to head up north to actually buy it and then on the morning when i woke up at 4 a.m to get to the airport for the uh, 620 flight. I got a text message to say that the flight has been canceled. And I was like, oh, I was really annoyed, but I knew if I don't go up there, up north and collect the car, the dealer will sell the car to someone else. So I took an expensive taxi drive into London. It cost me 120 pounds, jumped in on a train and headed up north and I purchased the car. And I love the way that it looks. This pension spec is quite inconspicuous. And funny enough, my children struggled to find the car in the first like one or two weeks because it blends in with everything else around it, like the tarmac and the sky. So if you want to be invisible, this is the car for you. So why did I purchase this car? Um, I've owned a couple of cars, mainly BMWs. My most recent one was a uh, 2019 BMW M140i. 
Uh, I owned that for four years and I have also owned a 2019 BMW X3, a 2015 BMW X3 and a um, 2013 3 Series 320D. And I've also test driven lots of different cars and I've had really fun loaners as well. Um, so I'm basically a car guy. Um, however, I had owned too many BMWs in a row and felt like there's a bit of a, a need for a change, especially since I was getting a little bit desensitized to new cars. Like they're all or great cars and they all feel a little bit samey. And it was time to buy something completely different. Um, I considered the Dacia Jogger because it's a different brand and I like the price of it. It's literally the cheapest uh, seven seater car that you can buy brand new and um, especially for like under 20 grand which is impressive um, since the list price of many cars have gone up drastically over the last couple of years um, like now if you are looking to buy a car the same car with the same deposit three years ago um, now you could end up paying double the price in your monthly payments if you paid like uh, 299 pounds in um, 2019 for a car this year it might be 600 pounds so they have gone up quite a lot in price and that's uh, and that's had also has also been compounded um, by the increase in interest rates for new cars APR for some of them is 11 percent or 10 percent um, versus 2.5 or 3 percent many years ago um, and for me when I saw that in April I thought I'm out there is no way that I'm going to pay these inflated uh, uh, numbers for cars that are almost the same as they were a couple of years back, like with the same engine, same gearboxes, similar tech. It's just not worth it to me. Um, and that's when I came across the Dacia Jogger, specifically the uh, hybrid variant with an automatic gearbox. So automatic gearbox is quite important for me because where I live, there's a lot of start and stop traffic, but I also find that at the end of car journeys, I'm a lot calmer and less tired if I've driven an automatic car versus a man manual one. Um, but then the Dacia Jogger can also potentially be used as a car for camping as been advertised with the big camping box that you can buy that allows you to fit a double bed no, not a double bed, a double mattress, and you also have space for your stove and other uh, camping paraphernalia, uh, which is quite cool because with my kids aged five and um, seven, I'm actually entering that age of potentially camping with them next year, both in the UK and also on continental Europe. So that's why the Dacia Jogger kind of appealed to me. Uh, and they also consider the Skoda Kodiak because it's also another seven seater. Um, but then with the Jogger, the hybrid one is over 20 grand. And that to me is not a very attractive value proposition for a Dacia because for that money, you could look at used cars that might offer more value for money. However, some of them are not seven seaters. Um, and also there wouldn't be brand new, so you wouldn't have the peace of mind or, uh, um, of being able to have warranty. Uh, and that's when uh, all of a sudden I researched a couple of other cars and I came across this E-Class. Um, and for me, reliability is the top priority. Like I do not want a car that is going to cost me a lot of money in terms of repair. And I do not also want to spend a lot of time taking a car back and forth to a garage because that's very disruptive for school runs for work for leisure time with the children and usually if you want a very reliable car you should ideally have as few moving pieces as possible so this would be a manual car front wheel drive um no turbocharging standard suspension no four wheel drive um, that would be a super bulletproof car. And that car is a Toyota Corolla from probably around 1996, 1995. And I did look at one of them, but they are quite expensive, like 2,500, even like four grand for some of them, which is more than you would pay for a car that's even like 10 years newer. But it's understandable. If you want a bulletproof car, 
that's the type of car where you can even skip two oil changes and the car isn't even going to break that that car will basically outlive you however i am not ready for bland motoring and uh, i also need a uh, automatic gearbox and surprisingly that toyota does come with an automatic gearbox as well if you want one and it's not just any automatic gearbox but it's the most reliable type which is a torque converter other gearbox types that are automatic includes cvt and dual clutch however the torque converter is the most reliable one and this e-class has exactly that because uh, the subsequent generations that came afterwards do not have a torque converter but they have other types of gearboxes that have more gears they're more fuel efficient a little bit better for acceleration but they're not as reliable and also this car is very popular as a taxi it certainly was back in the days and the E-Class is still a popular taxi car and the 2 litre diesel is the most reliable one as well. And that's the engine choice that I picked over the petrol ones and also over the V6 diesels. Um, the petrol ones are nice, um, however, their fuel economy is not great, um, especially the entry level petrol engine. So I would recommend that you stay away from them. But with this car, I can achieve and not even can. I actually achieve 45 um, MPG on most of my journeys, which is fantastic. Um, and I've never owned a Mercedes. So I thought, let's buy a Mercedes. And because also the good thing about this car is that it's packed with a lot of features that or actually, um, not, yeah, they might even be rare in a car that's quite a bit newer. This car has automatic headlights. It has a rain sensor that automatically activates the windscreen wipers and switches them off as well. It has uh, part electric seats. It has soft closed boot. Um, it also has um, electric windows all around. Um, there is also a um, digital gauge in the speedometer and there's a lot of other nice luxuries as well like xenon headlights which is having halogen uh, halogen ones and um, yeah so it doesn't really feel that old and it really highlights what Jimmy Clarkson once said is that the Ford Focus showcases uh, no it, he he said that and it actually highlights what Jimmy Clarkson once said, which is that a Mercedes S-Class highlights the features that will be standard on a Ford Focus 20 years later. And with this car being 16 years old, it's not actually an S-Class, but it's an E-Class. But it does have a lot of features that actually only recently have become standard on smaller cheaper entry-level cars. And this even includes like speed limiter and cruise control which is what this car has um, but i've also taken things a little bit further i have fitted a head unit an android head unit that includes apple carplay and android auto and this has taken decades off the age of the car it feels incredibly modern like you jump in and you have access to the same infotainment that you would have access to um on an 80 grand bmw or 150 grand range rover and it's so nice to to, um, to like have your phone in the pocket you jump in and the phone connects wirelessly with apple carplay with the head unit and you have spotify and uh, um, all your messages and can basically um, manage your journey without having to pick up your phone it is really good and i highly recommend it and that's also one of the reasons why i purchased this car because i knew that i could um retrofit and and like wireless and wired apple carplay for around 170 pounds and i can do so with the unit that includes a touch screen and where everything looks factory it doesn't look aftermarket because there are other e-class generations as well like the one afterwards the w2112 um with that one there are 
aftermarket head units as well however some of them are not touch screen and those that are touch screen they don't quite sit flush with the design and they stick out making it quite obvious that you have added an aftermarket head unit um and um those newer cars also have the latest gearbox which is of course is prone to technical issues and also if you have um the some of the newer diesels that have add blue sensors and add blue sensors can fail and that is something that this car does not have so like therefore i wanted to make sure to buy a car that is that feels relatively new but there's not so new that it has a lot more things that can go wrong but also that it's not so dated that it feels like an ancient car because um this one is quite feature packed even from a safety point of view it has um lots of airbags like it has curtain airbag airbags and um yeah i'm gonna put up here on the screen so that you know you can see where all the um airbags are and it's really really safe to be in and it's an incredibly safe car which is really important um on the tech front i also retrofitted a reversing camera which this car needs because it's really long it's long to the point that when you park it in some parking bays it sticks out so when you park it you want to make sure that it sticks out as little as possible and therefore having a reversing camera that enables me to park with millimeters precision really helps and i've also added blind spot mirrors that cost me two pounds fifty and they also help with parking because that um because they help me almost see the corners of the car which i can't even see with a uh reversing camera so i highly recommend this two pounds fifty and they can be stuck on to any car called car and they also help with parking uh when i'm uh when i'm parallel parking i can see the rear wheels and it ensures that i'm up as close to the curb as possible without curbing the alloys again two pounds fifty bargain and i genuinely wish that i bought these for every previous car that i had and it even negates the need for a um dipping um side mirror to help you park my previous bmw it had a dipping mirror um but this car although the mirrors do fold in they do not actually dip so get those blind spot mirrors they are really good and inside for space it is spacious uh, i'm super comfortable up front these headrests are fully adjustable like up and down the seats are part electric part manual if I want to slide forwards and backwards, it has a lever, which is good in case I need a little bit of room to hoover the car or to pick up something that's fallen under my seat. Um, and then the electric part is for raising the seat up and down and also tilting the seat pad. Um, a cool thing that I've never seen in a car before are adjustable anchor points for the seat belts, and they are super handy for children because because with children you want to make sure that the seat belt is not over the neck but that they actually sit over the chest and being able to change to lower and increase the height of the anchoring point give you additional flexibility um and it has those both in the front seats and both in the rear seats i've never had it before it's super cool um from the driver's seats there are also two visors um which is quite handy i've never had that in the car before either um cabby wise and storage wise there is a big glove box there is um storage on the dashboard where you can put business cards but i put in like i basically use that as my bin up front and on the center console there are two places for storage one of them that includes a 12 volt cigarette lighter point as well as space for your glasses um, and then as you go further back um, on the armrest there is a big cubby there is also um, um, some some armrest storage and then there's also a big armrest storage bin underneath as well and in the doors you have door bins that are all lined they're all felt lined and the same applies to the ones 
in the rear seats as well so there you have door bins but you also have cigarette ashtrays again it shows you what the priorities were like um in the notice which was for people to be able to smoke in comfort um but those ashtrays can also be used as bins they can fit like you know a couple of wrappers um and there's also a 12 volt cigarette lighter in the back with with a uh, bin right underneath it and uh, between the two rear seats there is an armrest that can be pulled down and then and in there there's some storage and uh, that includes space for pencils business cards and there's also a section that's felt lined where you can put your jewelry or bracelets um, and there are also pop out cup holders unfortunately there are no cup holders um, in the front and instead, my partner solved the problem by buying this for me, which is a narrow bottle that can be wedged between the center console and the front seats. So, so that solves the problem. And I can also get another one for the front passenger. Um, but I also have another space for more regular shaped shaped bottled which is a storage net a storage net here in the footwell of the passenger in the front and uh, in terms of nets behind the the front seats there are pouches the kids store their books the pouches are big they are the biggest ones that I've ever had in a car before and they can fit like proper like a4 sized writing pads and there's a lot that can fit in there like books crayons and um, and and markers toys as well and that is good and the boot is a cavernous uh, 690 liters the boot is actually fascinating like there are so many unique features there first of all the boot isn't just 690 liters but the boot is completely flat um, even when you fall down the second row it's perfectly flat and with no no load lip either there's two big cubbies with storage net and they can fit quite a lot of junks like we all as parents periodically use the boot as a dumping ground and you need places to 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 basically keep stuff that's not gonna move around or be lost it has that it also has a parcel shelf that automatically retracts um when you open the boot and then once you close the boot it automatically pulls back um, the partial shelf is not removable which is good because that means that you do not need to take it out of the car if you're going to fall down the the second row but it's actually fixed to the second row so when you fold those two seats down and you want to use the whole boot like you don't need to take the partial shelf off which is a major major plus um the the, the car also has a cargo net and um, they can be used if you're transporting a lot of cargo in the car like doing a run to the dump or if you want to put a dog in the boot the cargo net actually has two anchor points the first anchor point is right behind the second row but if the second row is folded down there's also another anchor point right behind the front seat which means that you can potentially transport seven dogs in there uh, which is quite cool and um, that is quite cool and I have actually transported a friend's dog in my boat uh, purely happened when they essentially went on holiday for a couple of days and they needed me to look after the dog I took the car with the dog in there and fabulous it really worked well and um, I spoke about camping before and this is the car that you could potentially camp in um, in a bit more of an efficient way compared with the Dacia Jogger. So if you want to camp in the Dacia Jogger, you've seen the big camping box. Um, that is an optional extra. I don't remember whether it was £2,600 or 3000 around then. However, if you use that, you have to remove the third row. And you also need to have the second row folded. And when you're not using that big camping box, you then need to take it out of the car and store it somewhere. So, so with the camping box in it, you lose the functionality of the second row. But you also have less volume of space in the car as well because you'll be 
you know, when you sleep, you'll be a lot closer to the headliner as well. However, because this E-Class has a completely flush boot with no protruding fixing points or anything, you can just lie there in the boot without a mattress. Or, or even if you wanted a mattress, you can have a rolled up one, an inflatable one that you basically roll out, inflate, and sleep comfortably in the back without having to spend additional money um, on a camping box and also being able to quickly convert your car from a five-seater to a space that you can sleep in. And it's also so spacious that I'm able to lie in there at the back and sleep with some, with, you know, with like some other camping paraphernalia next to me. I've even tried to lie in the back with my partner and there's plenty of space for even two adults and two kids to lie in there and hang out. And I've been using the car almost a bit of like a beach tent. Like when we go on the beach, occasionally after being in the water, the kids are either either a little bit tired or want some rest or just want to be indoors. And then I folded down the second row and we've all just been at the back. Like we've chilled, we've really hung out and I've also had a beach tent pitched up there on the grass and we've essentially had two indoor places to hang first of all the car and then secondly the tent down below um and it's not just being able to use the car for camping but it can also be used as a bit of a mobile office um you can easily have a laptop in there or or like an ipad with a keyboard have like a small table sit and also get some work done in the boot there is a 12 volt 12 volt 12 in the boot there is a 12 volt socket and in there i plug in a cigarette 12 volt lighter that has usb c point and a normal usb point of a fast charging so i use that to basically charge a power bank and then that means that when the car is at standstill i have a power bank that I can use to charge my laptop, phones, etc. So, so like that enables me to be out by the beach or somewhere for like, you know, an extended period without having to worry about um, running out of uh, power, etc. So overall, it's a potentially really good car for camping or micro camping at the cost of only three grand, which is almost the cost of the camping box in the Dacia jogger and genuinely that flat floor does make a big difference and i'm someone who is um 181 centimeters tall which is roughly uh five foot eleven or six foot and there is plenty of room for me to lie back there and be highly comfortable so i do look forward to trying out camping in this car um next year at some point in the uk and even abroad um, and what also makes this a good car for camping is the comfort. It's a very well insulated car. It's quiet. One time I drove past the tractor and the tractor was driving past me and I didn't even hear the tractor until the very moment that we passed each other. And as soon as we'd passed each other, I didn't hear the tractor at all. It's incredibly quiet despite not having a uh, double glazing and, um, around like all the door shuts, you, you know, you can see like cloth insulation rather than rubber. Um, everything in here is like um, soft touch materials. There's hardly any rough, rough, scratchy plastic. It's, a, you know, it's an incredibly quiet cabin to be in and it's highly well built. And you can tell that this car comes from a generation when Mercedes were highly prioritizing quality and the car does feel a cut above um, a lot of recent modern cars as well. Reliability wise there isn't much that I'm afraid of. This is a car that can run easily to 500,000 miles or 600,000 miles um, without having any major issues as long as you do the oil services and look after the car. Um, some cars do have air suspension and, and, um, it's called airmatic and that can fail. 
And when that fail, you might end up with a bill of £1,000. My car being in the state always has aromatic in the rear, but it doesn't have it in the front. Some do have it in the front as well. But with the saloon, there are some variants that don't have aromatic at all. But for the estate, all of them have rear self-leveling suspension. So I'm fully aware that it can happen, that the failure could happen at some point, but I factored that in into my purchase price and newer Mercedes, they have aromatic as well. And usually in life, your happiness will be heavily influenced by your expectations. So therefore, if you don't expect something to happen, you're likely to be very unhappy when it happens. But if you expect it, then it's going to affect you less. And therefore, I expect aromatic to happen and I've budgeted one grand for that, um, which in the grand scheme is not a lot of money. If you think about cars, like if you buy your brand new car for like 50 grand or 80 grand, you will lose a grand in depreciation every single month for the first year at least. So when you have a car, you're always going to pay for something, whether it's depreciation, high running cost, or the occasional services. Um, with the exception of that, um, the electronics of this car, it's best to buy the um, models after 20, for, from like 2006. They are a bit more reliable um, with regards to technology. Uh, with regard, they are more re they are more reliable uh, with regards to electronic gremlins versus the cars that came out in two thousand and three, um, and it's a good price that I paid for the car, and it served me well. It's done um, one hundred and twenty thousand miles, which is um, which which is high. But it's not high for an E-Class. As I mentioned before, the E-Class is a popular taxi vehicle. It's designed to be driven. It's designed to do many miles. And it's happiest when it's on the motorway. And it does drive like a brand new car. It, 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 it's very smooth, like the engine. It's highly smooth. And it also helps that it doesn't have start and stop. Um, and the power delivery, it does 0 to 62 in about 9.1 seconds. Uh, and it develops 400 newton meters of torque and outputs 170 horsepowers. And that is actually comparable um, with newer cars like diesel engines with two liter engines as well as as um, petrol engines by some cars. And um, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. The most impressive thing about it is the drivability. Um, it doesn't lurch. There's no like gaps in performance in the rev range and the power delivery is always consistent whether you're doing 20 miles an hour 30 miles an hour or 60 and that makes it relaxing to drive and uh, it's also power powerful enough to have seven passengers in it i've had seven people in it and we averaged 54 miles to the gallon whilst going uphill and even driving on the motorway <clears throat> it didn't feel like the engine was gutless or that it was struggling, but the engine perfectly matches the use case for the car. Um, and that is pleasing. More power would have been nice. However, it's not a car that I am likely to rag in the corners because if you rag a car of this size in the corner, like you will feel some of the weaknesses with regards to ha handling. By being an avant-garde model, it is genuinely enjoyable to drive in the corner it doesn't lean it doesn't have too much body roll um elegance or classic would have been nicer for a little bit more more comfort but i think the handling being a little bit more stable in corners actually fits my personality quite well because i like performance cars i will eventually buy a performance car to basically um complement the this car but i'll wait until the car market has brought prices down a little bit so far i've done four thousand miles on the car and um, i'm going to keep doing more miles in it and the kids love it and friends enjoy being in it as well it has lots of like nice quirks and features that i've not experienced in cars before and it kind of, no kind of offers a glimpse into um cars in the noughties, especially like seeing the number of different spaces for business cards and pens and pencils in here. 
Um, I do have a couple of modifications that I might want to do as well. Um, I have also fitted a, uh, uh, a subwoofer that fits in the sp uh, space saver whale basically and I'll do a separate video on that. I have added a scuff plate for the bumper in the rear to basically ensure that the kids don't scratch the bumper when they're climbing um, in and out of the boot. However, there was actually a crack on the bumper in the rear and that scuff plate perfectly covers it. And some of the rubber around the rear tailgate was looking a little bit old, which is perfectly normal because rubber after 16 or 17 years can get a little bit tired. So I bought a roll of draft excluding rubber on Amazon for about six pounds. And I rectified the problem that way around the trunk tailgate, but also between the bumper and the tailgate as well. And that is to ensure that there's no water seeping into places that shouldn't have water and resulting basically in the car prematurely rusting. That's it. That is some insight into my E-Class E220 CDI w211 generation i highly recommend it do look into it as a family car and ask me any questions that that you might have about ownership um, choosing the right car reliability or if you've owned an and e-class before and have some tips and tricks for me thank you very much bye bye